Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Some of the top issues of 2014 include things like Ebola, jobs recovery, midterm elections, the advent of ISIS, the broader adoption of gay marriage, racial tensions in Ferguson, the Affordable Care Act reform, the NSA and your privacy, and of course, the dramatic drop in oil prices. Happy New Year and welcome back to the most widely watched dialogue on Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William and on this special two part year end wrap up and New Year forecast, we will host four of our resident economists to wait in on those things that most talked about last year and what may, what may most affect our lives and businesses going forward in 2015. Please stay with us. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, the Economic Year in Review, featuring Frank Hefner of the College of Charleston, Doug Woodward, University of South Carolina, John Connaughton of UNC Charlotte, and Harry Davis from Appalachian State University. Now, here's Chris Williams. Happy New Year. Welcome to our program, gentlemen. Uh, this might be one of our favorite programs. And I know I said this, say this to you every year, but it, it, it's just the energy and the ideas and the exchange of ideas. And, um, and I'm, I'm, this is a good thing. I'm saying a, a good thing to you, even, even to you, Jim. Finally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but welcome to the program. Yeah, this, is a, this is an important dialogue, we think, because you guys tend to be pretty free form about it. So let's start with 2014. What was, uh, Harry, we'll, we'll start with you. What was the biggest story in 2014? I mean, I mean personal as well as business. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on again. This is yeah. a great show. Uh, you know, 2014, we really did turn the corner on the economy, I think, and economic growth. Job growth was very solid in North Carolina and nationally and really picked up in the second half of the year in the third quarter. So, the, you know, the November employment number is really a solid number. So that was a surprise on the upside. Corporate profits continue to surprise on the upside. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of good things about the economy that have all shown up in the last six months. Yeah. So 2014 is a good year. Yeah. Anybody else? What was the biggest story? Oil. Oil, yeah, without I, a doubt. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt in my mind. And I think a lot of the, I think the drop in oil prices has gone a long way to take an economy that was in its fifth year of recovery and just kind of bumping along and all of a sudden give it a shot in the arm. I don't think, I mean, the oil prices have dropped so much. They were peaked out, Brent crude peaked out about $111 in June. It's now down below $60. It's had a couple of days below $60. Mm -hmm. um, that's a drop that is so, so great that it doesn't matter what the Democrats, it doesn't matter what the Republicans do, they can't mess up the economy going forward. Um, well, it's I'm not too hands. sure about that. I mean, I'm the, pretty sure it's the economy. You can always mess it, it up. It gives them a cushion. Yeah, it gives them a cushion. It gives that you're right on that. So it, I mean, it's it, like a stimulus. It gives them a it's lead. Than, yeah, yeah, it gives so, them a cushion so that if they make a policy mistake, it may not be as bad as it would have been or could have been. Could have been. But of all the other things, um, and, and I don't really want to get into the politics of this at all. But the oh, election clearly was a big event. And, you mean the midterm was the, the big midterm? Yeah, you think that was the biggest event? Uh, for the Biggest year, effect. I mean, when you're looking at all the broad things that happened in the United States and the world at the time, I mean, that is a change. And, yeah. and so, uh, With you know, we Implications for the future. Excuse me? With implications. With implications for, yeah. for the future and a lot of other things. But what I did notice is that the um, economic uh, policy uncertainty index of the Fed has been dropping. 
And that, to me, is a big sign for this year also. Okay, so that, that kind of springboards off the midterm mm -hmm. elections. What do you think? I, well, I definitely agree with oil mm -hmm. gas prices. You just drive down the street and just in shock. You know, mm -hmm. I can't believe this is happening. And that's, you know, it's been so positive for consumer spending. Mm -hmm. If without that, I think we have a much weaker economy. In South Carolina, we had pretty good job growth, 2 percent, just like North Carolina, doing right. pretty well on the job front. Consumer spending has come back. but. One story was, it's, it's actually a non-story, is, you know, I expected last year quantitative easing unwinding this year right. in 2014, and there would have implications, interest rates would start to drift up. You know, it didn't happen, so I guess we're looking have to look for that in the future. And and the other thing is is the dollar strengthening. Mm -hmm. Didn't really see that coming as is as, as, str as strongly as it has. Right. So, so the so other one is that the oh. other non-event that's important, we didn't have inflation. But right. that, but that's kind and of what so you're that's the other non-event. Yeah. Well, right. okay, yeah. but right. but you know, all right, right. gentlemen. So no you, taper tantrum. So you tip down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember that? You know about the unwinding of sure. the Federal the Reserve. Taper tantrum. And yeah, the the markets would go crazy. But so we got through that. So it's hard to imagine a better scenario for 2015. We're not going to talk mm. about 2015 till, till part two next week. But John, can oil prices get too cheap? Okay, good question. Doug mentioned something early. Just kind of hit the stimulus in terms of the impact of this. Just to put it in perspective, we've seen gasoline prices since this summer drop almost a dollar, and we expect more to happen in the future. We can talk about that later. But when you think about it, every time it drops by 50 cents a gallon, the annual impact of that is about $140 billion. To put that in perspective, that was like the 2% Social Security tax holiday that we had for a couple of years. That was a, the price take on that was about $150 billion. So we've had essentially a $300 billion annual stimulus pumped in the economy during this second half of this year. From market prices so, on from, oil. Right. Just from market prices. Even but better, though, because some of that... Well, Harry, you're going to have to jump in here. Well, I'm going to jump in right now before I forget the, the <laughs> number, the 2% uh, with the Social Security. That didn't end up doing very much. At and the time. At the time. And, and then it phased out. And so that's the thing. We don't know whether the gas prices will stay low. And for, you know, in my own personal life, that's $800 a year for me because I use about 800 gallons of gas a year is what I calculate. And so a dollar reduction gives me $800 of spending okay. this year. At, you know, over 10 months, yeah, we're talking 80 bucks. So that goes to your increased health care bill. That's what happens to me. It's yeah. going to my increased health care cost. It's going to go, I've got higher property taxes. It does not allow me to go out to have dinner. Harry? Yeah, but for the average person, it is $800 in after-tax dollars. Yes. And for the average person, that's a lot of money. Yes. Right. And if you look at the r most recent retail mm -hmm. sales figures, which came out this week, mm -hmm. it's led to a much more efficient allocation of resources. Instead of going to the filling station or gas station and putting in a tank, now I have to make decisions about where does that money go? Do I buy shoes? Do I buy groceries? What do I buy? And the new retail sales figures show it's across the board, sporting equipment, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's great for the economy. So as we go forward, this, this will really have a serious impact, mm -hmm. as John says. Back to the politics for just one second. Okay. It's great to have the Republicans running the Congress and the Democratic president. They now have to work together. This is exactly what happened when Bill Clinton yeah, was president. But here's the they thing. will work together. Harry, I agree with they you. They will, will work, work together. together. Well, but they didn't work together in 2011. No, but, but then you had a split c Congress. Okay, this is different. This Harry's is different. absolutely right. This is back when, when you had a Republican House and a Republican Senate, and you had Bill Clinton, or even going past further than that with, with Reagan. Right. Um, it's a different situation. You can't pass, the president can't pass the buck to, the, to Harry Reid anymore. And something's going to come out of Congress now, and the president's got a simple choice. He has to negotiate something he can, he can live exactly. with. Or he's going to be the president of no for the next. Well, now years. we're looking forward and uh, yeah. just looking backward again uh, yeah, okay. into 2014. <clears throat> you know, I just want to make one more point though about the the gas prices. One thing we've seen in t how it's affected our economy is tourism's come back. We're mm -hmm. a drive-in state, and that's been the most mm -hmm. dynamic sector mm -hmm. in our economy. So, you know, people are coming down from the north and making trips. Right. I think they're spending that $800 partly in yeah. South Carolina's coast, maybe North Carolina so as well. So, how did some of the, how did some of the global uncertainties hit the? the it, as you said, Doug, not just tourism in both states is, is the single largest industry, but both states are also net exporters of goods and services. So how did a, glo a global uncertainty in 2014 reflect in state GDP or state 
Uh, Global uncertainty? Well, you know, you have a lot of uncertainty, of course, mm -hmm. around Europe right now, and we're very exposed in, uh, in the Carolinas to European trade relatively, but it's not a big part. It's not nothing like, you know, cons the consumer sector of the economy, our, our exports. So uh, we're not too worried about that. We haven't seen any big implications of the slowdown in Europe yeah. uh, affecting us. Uh, well, I think one of the other um, issues that is uh, kind of underlined in the labor markets, which are really interesting these days, the way the labor market is or is not moving, is the increase in manufacturing employment in the United States and especially in the Carolinas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that, that, that happened this year. So that speaks to what you said. Yeah. This has been a good year in terms of solid growth. We, we've been talking about a recovery for, what, four years? And <clears throat> finally, we got one. Um, in fact, it led me to, you know, if you want to do the up and downs where people say the average typical recession lasts so long, we're, we're, we're at a peak right now in terms of where historically people would start talking about a downturn. And then as soon as I said that, some of the audience said, but there's nothing average about the last five years. So you can't use those average rules of thumb anymore. This Finally getting into a recovery. Yeah, we, yeah. this is, this, we're, we're here. I don't know what you want to call what we had, right. but now yeah. we, we're right where we should Two be. Two things will follow up on yeah. that, Frank. This, okay. re, this expansion mm -hmm. has lasted 65 months so right. far. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the total of 33 expansions that we've had since 1854 that mm -hmm. the NBER right. keeps track of, this is the sixth longest. Right. That surprises a lot of people, but it's been one of those slow and steady. It's the turtle recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it the second that. half of this year, Harry's right, the second half of this year, the calculus changed on that. Right. We can argue as to why, but the calculus changed. The first quarter was not that good. <clears throat> no, and what's happened is, right. nationally, right. this year, we got all the jobs back that we lost in the Great Recession. Right. So mm -hmm. we're, we lost 8.7 8 million, we've gained back 10 million plus, mm -hmm. okay? The second thing is, in the state of North Carolina, which we didn't expect till next year we'd actually get to that point. Mm -hmm. We've got back there in, in, this year. I mean, this last <laughs> You mean October, the jobs, you jobs that you expected come back next year actually showed up in the, North Carolina, Carolina this, this year. year. We, we surpassed, we, 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 we got back to our pre-recession job number high as of the mm -hmm. October uh, employment release. So we're back now at the same employment level today that we had back in December of 2007 okay. when this whole thing okay. began. Ho hold on with that, Doug, because Harry, you said something in your opening comments uh, about the statistical measures in the economy. And what I was thinking is, is a comment that I had heard from someone at the Federal Reserve that said what they are concerned about is productivity. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look like it's as strong as it should be, and they're puzzled as, of as to why. So if productivity, and, and productivity is an important thing in expanding markets. I don't think that's Absolutely. lost on you. But do you agree with that, and how does that play into everything that you've heard so well, far? Well, product, we, American corporations have been getting incredibly productive, incredibly efficient. <laughs> productivity has been growing at very high levels. It can't continue to do that forever. So any slowdown there is almost to be expected. But the manufacturing sector is doing great in this country. Uh, the ISM index has been above 50 since mm -hmm. f forever almost, and every month this year, the, the manufacturing sector is expanding very rapidly. Interest rates are down. Interest rates are going to stay down. They're not going up next year. We've gotten a gift from Europe in the sense that the Fed started backing out of the Q QE, and so interest rates were supposed to go up. The Europeans <laughs> drove their rates so low that they've been buying our treasuries, driving our rates down getting out of the euro, getting into dollars, and now they're going to go back to euros and buy them very cheaply. So the Fed, while it's been backing out, the Europeans have taken their place, and that's why interest rates have stayed so low, and that's going to continue. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Doug, I had cut you off. Did you have something to add? I want to go back to something John was talking about. You know, certainly the job growth has been um, mm -hmm. fantastic over the last, uh, last year, but the quality of the jobs, at least what we see in South Carolina, is not where we'd expect it to be at this stage of the business cycle. We're seeing a lot of hiring in contract labor, temporary. Mm -hmm. um, that's the biggest growth of jobs, and that's a concern, and it's reflected in the income, not wages and salaries not growing as rapidly as they would as we move towards, or we would expect moving mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. full employment. Although, <laughs> I want to say, we're not at full employment. We're at 6.7 percent unemployment rate in South Carolina, and that's very high for, you know, this stage, again, of the business yeah, cycle. Yeah, been, you've been consistently below South, uh, North yep. Carolina, for, and now we're below you. Right. But <clears throat> just as kind of a juxtaposition of that, the November wage numbers were the first surprise that we had. You mean uh, that 
big 321,000 jobs added thing? It wasn't the jobs added, wages. it was the wages. Right. For the first time, we actually saw wages Some go wages. up. Yeah. And it's, you know, I hate to say this, it's kind of the old economic supply and demand right. issue. As, as labor markets tighten. Can we tighten, all say that together? Yeah, we can all say that together. <laughs> as labor markets tighten. Do you say anything together? No. Yeah. <laughs> no I didn't think so. As labor markets tighten, we expect mm. to see wages start right. to rise. It's sure, been the absolutely. slack labor markets that we've had for the past five years that have kept wages down. So it, it, it's not just the quality, the specific uh, you know, industry or occupation that we look at jobs yeah. at. It's also the tightness of the labor market that has an impact on wages. And mm -hmm. we're well, starting to see that we're starting to see that shift right now. So I it's think. not an anomaly. It's not a start again, stop again thing. I, mean, I don't you think I this is the beginning of a trend in, in increasing I, I believe wages. that it is. Well, I, I, think, I, yeah. there, I think there are two things that are working: one for it, and one against that statement. And one is um, there's something called the churn rate, which is the, the amount, the percentage of people that switch jobs, mm -hmm. and that has been at a very, very low level. And in the past recoveries, churn rate was a little higher, and that basically reflects more of an optimism. I would, when when you can feel as if you can quit this job to go get another job. Wage negotiation happens. Mm -hmm. You can start getting upward mobile wages. Uh, right now, that churn rate is still very low, unfortunately. And I have a feeling, correct me if I'm wrong on this, it's still a legacy of housing being an anchor instead of an asset. And so people just can't get yeah. up and move. Why is that case? It, you know, when you look at in, a, in South Carolina, along the coast, and mm -hmm. some of the metros in, mm -hmm. in, the, in these two states, you know, you'd be hard pressed to say that housing has been lagging. These numbers yeah. have been big in, right. in increases in, in sales. Am I wrong to well, think? Well, housing that? in North Carolina, you got to be in Raleigh and you got to be in Charlotte. I mean, that's housing right. in North Carolina, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get 50 miles from an interstate, there is yeah. no housing market. Mm -hmm. If you look at employment growth in this state, 60% of the jobs in the recovery were added in two places Raleigh and Charlotte. I mean, that's where you have to be in North Carolina for real solid economic growth is those two markets. And if you're not South in those Carolina, two markets. Would be Greenville probably in the low country, in the low Charleston. Country, yeah. Charleston yeah. Myrtle Beach was a big story. Yeah, it really came back right. in terms of housing. Yeah, Harry's right. This recovery has not been kind of broad-based. It's right. been, at least in the Carolinas, been very, very focused on the big metro, metro And unfortunately, areas, it hasn't been broad-based across yeah. skill sets. No. Which is the problem with the wages and the fact But again, mm -hmm. I'm going to argue this sure. again and again and again. <laughs> As labor markets tighten, right. you know, this is kind of this rising tide and all boats kind of sure, thing going sure. on. Yeah. This is really the, the, the biggest news that we've had in the second half of this year is well, that labor markets are starting, except for maybe South Carolina. They're not that tight. I was going no, to they're say not that 6.7% yeah. right. unemployment. But, but the other thing is in. it's working in that favor on that line is labor force participation has dropped. Mm -hmm. And so the lay, so what, and, and what the question is, I, I made this, I gave a talk the other day and I said, well, we had all these jobs at, at the peak in the last expansion. So one of the audience says, well, that was an artificial situation. I said, well, maybe the bubble was artificial, but those are real jobs. Those are real people yeah. that had jobs mm -hmm. and we lost all those jobs. Now, a lot of them haven't come back into the labor markets. I don't know where they're gone necessarily. There are a lot of issues, stories about that. But the question then is if labor force stays flat, and there's an increase in employment, you're going to get the wage growth. Okay, so. okay wait a minute. Before, before you guys get into this back and forth, and, <laughs> I, and I appreciate it from both of you, but we, we need to move on. And we're talking, you know, we've been talking about the clinical cause and effect, you know, productivity and labor markets and the cost of this and the cost of that. But let's talk about the emotional surprise in 2014. And when I look at it as a surprise, I'm talking about the more we heard about the uh, not just the Ebola scare, but the Ebola tragedy and the Ebola epidemic in some places, that had that started to have a real effect on capital markets and an increased volatility. And it mm -hmm. made people, it seemed like, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seemed to make people insecure about well, you know, the economy's going well, but what happens if something comes out of left field like Ebola, and what if this thing really blossoms? So, Doug, the, I think the question here is, um, uh, was Ebola a surprising negative effect on the economy or on the markets, and can something like that come out of left field and derail an economy? Well, I'm not a psychologist, but I can't understand why people were overreacted as they did to Ebola. And this is to somebody who traveled to Africa this year. And when I came back, I just Oops. saw people didn't want to <laughs> get near me. Uh, and I thought, do you know anything about Africa or where, where, what's happening there? I didn't even go to a region that's even close to that. But I saw how people were getting very emotional about this. And you mentioned the markets as well. Maybe they just needed something to create volatility. Uh, but. I think, you know, it, it was irrational. And there's always a bit of irrationality, I guess, that we have to factor into any of our forecasts or understanding of the, of the economy. It could have been something yeah. else. 
Well, but it just happened that that's uh, what we fixated on. Something we've debated, you know, talked about years, years ago. Let, let's separate this out. There's the economy and there's the stock market that we were talking about. Yeah. The economy, the Ebola scare had nothing, didn't change manufacturing employment in South Carolina or North Carolina. What it did is it changed perception on Wall Street, whatever that means. And that's an impossibility to predict. Uh, you know, you, you could spread a rumor up and down Manhattan mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the market could tank and the next day everyone wakes up and says, geez, why did it tank? And it goes back up again. Mm -hmm. So th that's, yes, that's, we're always going to be vulnerable to those kinds of activities just because the market does that. Mm -hmm. But very, it's very, market. very fickle and very short-lived. Mm -hmm. It didn't last very long at all. No. No. It gets mm -hmm. swamped by other items. Mm -hmm. The stock market's driven by earnings and mm -hmm. earnings of U.S. corporations have been double digit until just recently for, and been double digit for years. That's what drives the stock market. It's at record levels. Uh, it's going to stay there. Mm. Well, I shouldn't be. Right. I, yeah, I yeah, should yeah, get yeah. away from Careful. that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the stock market's doing very well. Borrowing costs are incredibly low. The Fed kept the bond rates very, very low. Were you surprised by? <clears throat> were you, it sounded like you were surprised about corporate profits and corporate earnings. But were you surprised that the Fed has been so aggressive in holding down the short rate? Uh, very much surprised. They kept rates down, but also the the midterm, the mid rate. And that's the one that has affected bond rates. So the U.S. corporations are borrowing more money this year, in the first three quarters of this year, than they've ever borrowed in a, a nine-month period. To do what? To buy back their own stock mm -hmm. to give stockholders returns. And so if you look at, I, I don't know how far you want to go with this, wealth is increasing at an incredible rate right. in this country, Tw $29 trillion since the recession. Somebody's getting an awful lot of money in this country. Mm -hmm. It's anybody who's in a 401k, some, anybody who owns something. Mm -hmm. Because what the Fed has done is propped up asset prices, whether it's your house or the stock market. And so if you're in those two places, you have made out like a bandit. Are, are we setting ourselves up again? Don't think it's as much as a setup mm -hmm. as, as people suspect. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to just say one. The, the Fed balance sheet, which has been the, the principal uh, way of passing liquidity into the economy and doing what Harry said, has gone from 600, are you ready for this, $600 billion at the start of this crisis to roughly $4.5 trillion now. So they've increased the size of their balance sheet at least sevenfold in, in this process mm -hmm. through QE1, QE2, QE3. Uh, the mix of what's in that $4.5 trillion, there's a lot of uh, increase in on ownership of Treasury notes and bonds. But there's also been a lot of, I guess, almost about a trillion and a half of mortgage-backed securities. Yeah. Here's the thing you got to understand. In September, the Fed made an announcement and said, hey, guys, don't worry about the one and a half trillion in mortgage-backed securities. We're not selling those. They're going to be with the balance sheet for quite some time. Okay? They're going to hang on to those. They principally bought them from Fannie and Freddie and Ginny. And they're going to stay on those things for, for quite some time. Until they mature? Until people Probably pay until these mortgages mature. off? And that was where the really big <clears> risk <throat> was in terms of when the Fed starts to wind <clears throat> down. What kind of hit are they going to take <clears throat> on the value of these as rates <clears throat> are rising and they got to sell these things <clears throat> at a discount because they're long-lived assets. And so they take a bigger discount hit when <clears throat> rates rise. Yeah. And what they basically <clears throat> said to us is, we don't have any plans to actually sell these things. We're, mm -hmm. we're quite happy with the return on these. And, and, they've, and they've stopped using the interest from these to reinvest in more of them, but they're not, okay. they're not planning on selling them. Doug? Well, it turned out to be a wise policy then, I think. I mean, uh, it you know, hasn't caused uh, inflation, and uh, it has helped raise asset prices, which is important for a lot of people when right. their 401k was mm -hmm. becoming a 21k uh, right. you know, a few years ago. <laughs> right. No, that made people nervous, held back consumer spending. and. You know, you, you said, is, is this, uh, are we setting ourselves up again? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I really don't see this as a, as a bubble. I mean, there will be corrections in the stock market. Uh, I don't know how much more housing can increase, especially in the urban areas in terms of uh, house prices. But I don't, I don't see it as a bubble. So I don't think we, we have that risk. Uh, I think we're in a pretty good place. Well, I think that uh, your statement about the Fed confirms something that I've been saying for years, and that is that the default rate never justified the collapse of the CDO market. Mm -hmm. what, is it, what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, they were priced at 3%. percent you got about 30 seconds. Okay. Long story short <laughs> is, if you have the liquidity and can wait out the market, you can recover everything. The problem mm -hmm. is, if you don't have liquidity and can't wait, then you end up Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. That's exactly and right. And so the Fed has the liquidity, so it can wait for all those long-lived assets to mature, They'll mature and they won't take the hit. There's not going to be a big loss to them. Right. Okay. And they'll last eight to ten years. Right. So mm -hmm. eight yeah. to ten years. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because people people refinance, people yeah. get divorced, and so on. So yeah. On. yeah. 
Um, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, uh, happy Christmas. Happy holidays. Good to have you Same all here. here. And Same. next week, stay with us, because next week we are going to be talking about 2015. Mm -hmm. And it, it most likely will be just as uh, compelling, maybe a little bit about public policy in, in along with the statistical and economic evidence that we've seen so far. Thank you for watching our program. Thank you for supporting our program these last 24 years. Uh, and we will continue the dialogue next week. Until then, I'm Chris Woody. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care, when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.